So the next talk is going to be by Ludmila Botello. Do I pronounce it correctly? <laughs> Botello, but it's okay. Like uh, I'm, okay, I'm just yeah. used to to at this point. Right. So but more more on 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 music. So um, please go ahead. So thanks again for <laughs> for this opportunity. And uh, now I'm going to talk more specifically about the project I've been doing with Rosalind, uh, which is a sub project for the previous presentation we just saw. And let's get started. First of all, uh, I would just want to make like some brief motivation because I'm a kid for the 90s. So I always been like fascinated with video games and pixel art and stuff like that. And I've always wondered like, wow, this old video games like they have very limited results. So how they could storage music, how they make like such things, how, how does it work to compress this amount of information to make such complicated and complex games and stuff. Because, okay, nowadays devices, they can handle pretty much like high definition, very nice simulations, almost realistic stuff. But what about old stuff? Atari or Super Nintendo stuff. Well, actually those devices, they have a, a, a dedicated uh, chipset just to do this, which is a programmable sound generator. And it was very simple. The, the number of channels was limited like up to four or five, it depends on the, the generation. The shapes of the sound is also very, very simplified, like triangles, sort of shapes. So this is not exactly a problem. Let's say this is a feature because of this. We have this new, very nice uh, sampling of music, which is called chiptune, which is something that to emulate this kind of sounds. And it's been using music industry, right? Like up to days, like in very modern compositions, people are literally plugging old video games to produce sounds. So. That says, uh, let's move actually for what I want to say. Music's quite complex, right? Like in the music like this, we can have like instruments that are monophonic, they are polyphonic. What's going on? Like, uh, and how we want to experience this? Like, let's suppose we have an old video game and I want to play, I don't know, like, how is it to do that? How is it to do that? There might be some, I don't know if it's on my side, but I, I can't hear your, uh, your audio well. It's somehow. It should be distorted a little bit. Yeah, yeah, the other people, the other people have the same issue. Uh, I'm sorry. If somehow your your voice is somehow faint and slightly distorted, so there is some issue with your audio, and um, uh, and it seems it seems on it's on your end. It was perfect just a few seconds ago. Maybe you have some echo or um, yeah, some suggestions about checking the battery. Just a second. Uh, I'm gonna change my background noise suppression a little bit. That might be, that might uh -huh. help, yeah. Is it different it now? Is, it, yeah, yeah, it is much better now. Okay, yeah. so let's go back. I'm sorry about the technical problem. Uh, as I was saying, like, okay, we want to identify things inside of music. So it's interesting to make some segmentation inside of music. Uh, the name of this process is like a phrase identification. So, and phrase in music is just like a piece of the sound, like a, some track, a small, a small piece, which is self-contained somehow, just like a phrase, like what I'm speaking right now. Music also has this in some sense. And for this, for this test, like, uh, okay, we want to extract feature, features from the song. There is a very famous, like a uh, simple algorithm to identify these boundaries between the phrases, like when a phrase start and end. And what is relevant? Okay, so now we make the segmentation, we want to extract information. So let's just take a look on this music sheet here. I don't know if you guys, it's clear for you, but it's like, a, basically what we have here is like a repetition of the notes between pauses. So basically like, uh, it doesn't, this is just a repetition like for whole music and it doesn't it's not adding much stuff right like it sounds like something in the background for instance this one lo actually looks like the main melody because we have a lot of fluctuations of the notes at the time and the duration uh so this looks more informationally rich which leads us okay so how we can identify this how we can measure how much information this phrase contains basically entropy information entropy like channel entropy and we're going to identify, for instance, like in this composition, like a pitch and rhythm entropy. Pitch is like in the sense of the frequencies of the notes, that, like as previously explained. And rhythm is more defined like the duration and pauses between the notes. This is gives us our sense of uh, um, 
of a rhythm, and this also can be quantified. And the, so the goal here, in some sense, is to maximize this information. We want to select the maximum information we want to extract because this is probably the main melody. And this is also this there is a reference how to check this in music as well. So from the phrase selection, we can make the following. Okay, uh, so now we make the segmentation stuff. Let's reduce this whole four tracks here. We have four tracks, one, two, three, four tracks in different colors. Let's reduce to just one. Okay, but music it has a certain flow. Each phrase has start and it has a fixed start and end position. So for instance, if we select this yellow one. It means we cannot select the other ones because they are conflicting. You see, like um, we can only go in foreign direction. Like if, unless you want, you have more tracks to select. We have more tracks available to with us. But let's suppose for simplicity, we just have one. So this is not possible. So instance, like okay, let's move. Let's give another example. Let's suppose we we had decide to select first the the red one. The one one is rich in information. So this is one possibility, for instance, which is not conflict. This is a uh, a. Uh, um, so this is a possible solution for this. Or we can also try to make a bigger risk, like a phrase that does a lot of time and then another one, a smaller one in the future. So why I'm talking about like this fix at any time and beginning and stuff. Actually, this is related with another kind of scheduling problem, which is the operational fix job scheduling. Sorry about this big name. So basically we have a set of, we have a list of jobs and we want to run these jobs in a certain machines, okay? And those jobs, as I said before, they have a fixed start and ending. They can be organized and stuff. So, and they have different weights. So they have like, for instance, if you select some jobs, you can, you know, get some more profit than the others. And this can be organized in very different ways, depending on how many machines you have. For instance, like for three machines, this is a possible solution. And this is a very nice solution because the machines, as you can see, the jobs are right next to the other. So there is no idle time. Idle time is just like, the machine is, is vacant, it's doing nothing. So like, uh, you're kind of losing money, right? But let's suppose this other solution here, you can actually going to get more weight, like the, you're going to maybe get some more profits. But on the other hand, you have some gaps between so the solution. So you have to think. Uh, you, what, for this sense, like maybe you can try to make like the maximize both, like having minimal idle time and also maximize the jobs. So this, for instance, like the, the lower solution, maybe it's not so interesting, it's an undesirable solution. And this kind of stuff, so um, we can formulate as a integer linear programming, like a, don't, don't worry about this, but the, the idea is like this. We have a, a um, uh, objective function that we want to maximize these weights, right, for each job, uh, subject to, to, to those constraints. So we want to assign, for instance, like for one job, uh, for it, every time, like a job, uh, um, is going to be assigned for a machine and a machine is not go going to be vacant and like uh, how can I explain this like this jobs has to be selected in a such way in the subset uh, in this I subset that the jobs are not going to collide to each other so like a machine can run one job each each time so we have to make sure this, this set of jobs that are going to be select are going to be like uh, moving from one to another without this collision in time so from this uh, we decide to we call this problem like office with minimal idle time. And we can formulate this in the following way. Uh, we want to make like, as a, we, we, we can introduce this, this music problem as this office minimal idle time problem. So we have the following, we, we can put this as a binary variables, as I explained before in the previous presentation, right? So if the variable, if the job XI is select, it's going to be set at one, otherwise zero. And we want to still make, minimize this function here when we have this weight. And now the weight we're going to have, it's just entropy, right? And we want to make in the following constraints. Um, so we want to make sure, like the, the best case scenario, it's like the number of jobs they're going to select is equal to the number of machines. But let's suppose that's like, uh, if you have more jobs, that should be very, very, very penalized. So we add, add this second constraint here. Okay, in the case, like, okay, in the case of the, with less jobs are going to be selected, they're also going to be penalized, but we want to make sure the penalization for very large number of jobs colliding is much higher. So that's why we have this double, double constraints here. And then we achieve this um, quite big equation here, just to describe, this is the cubo formulation of the problem. 
briefly explanation. So these P, P variables here are the penalties we want to add for the cases like uh, we have more jobs than machines. And we also have like uh, the second penalty P2 here. And we are using the select like variable A, uh, C. For the cases like for each instance, like for instance, let's suppose we have two tracks. So we're going to penalize for one tracks or, or machine, sorry. Uh, three, two tracks. Okay, so for the case of two, one, two, three, one, two is going to be penalized. Case three is the perfect case, so no penalization and so on, and plus the object function. So this is the whole thing we want to optimize. In a nutshell, <laughs> it's been a lot. Uh, let's uh, make some refreshments. So basically, first we do this phrase segmentation stuff um, for music and then phrase to jobs, make a cube formulation for it. Then we send the problem for a quantum annealing uh, device, and then we get the samples back, the solution, and sort this to the new tracks, machines, jobs, whatever we want to set up. So part of the pro this so in the sense this is a, a hybrid algorithm. One part we run in a classical computer, and another part we run, we're going to run in a quantum computer. So um, now that we have the samples, there is also some a little bit of post processing we have to do. So okay, let's suppose we selected these jobs here. So now we have a list of jobs sorted according to the end of the of the time of each job. So we can actually make some something called a greedy scheduling algorithm, which is following the such way. Like one machine is going to select the jobs until like uh, okay, there is no conflict. So in the case of conflict, the another machine is start taking the jobs and so on until the jobs are sorted. And now we can generate the song for it. So in that in that case, I'm just going to give an example. Let's suppose here Beethoven. Okay, oh my God, like uh, very nice music. And there are a lot of instruments here, as you can see. But for instance, I let's suppose you want to make like reduction for a synthesizer just to tracks. Easy piece, right? So let's see the original composition. I hope you guys can hear that. <laughs> I think you guys know this one so like uh, and then the redu reduction version is going to be something like this okay very quickly as you can see like us you you lose some information in the process but the, but the main idea is there somehow so but this is just the beginning. This is just like uh, I study of the, of the information, and sometimes this reduction of the tracks it can be it can be weird, sound weird, because like sometimes you select the phrases that not sound very nice together. So like uh, for instance, we can implement a, a, a future like a uh, work we can do is implemented some dis dissonance criteria. Dissonance is this feeling of hearing something that doesn't you know really combine together. So this is, can be used as, a, as a, a constraint to make like a, things better as well. And for instance, let's suppose you want to, instead of reducing this music for a synthesizer, you want to reduce for, I don't know, um, a piano or, or guitar. This is going to be completely different for each instrument because they have different ranges. For instance, the things you can do in a guitar is like basically with like one hand for pulling the, the I don't know, the strings, another hand to make the chords. So like uh, there are some limitations and it's very different from playing the piano. We can play like 10 keys, 10 notes at the same time. So different instruments dif needs different adaptations and different constraints. For instance, and also because of the range, like we, piano has a, a bunch of uh, way more keys and etc. So this is it for now. Um, and thank you for your attention. Any questions? Great, thank you. Thank you also for keeping time actually. <laughs> yeah, we were behind shadow. Um, there is one question in the chat. So uh, Balash is asking, how can we say that maximum information is necessarily better sounding? Sorry. Uh, the last message. It's not necessarily better sounding, but it's more information rich. Because for instance, like uh, in terms of ent entropy information, like uh, let's think about this. It's, it's just calculate like uh, the probability of certain events, right? So what's the information entropy is, is doing is giving like uh, the degree of surprise. More surprise, you remember the more. Like, you know, like uh, when something is full of scale and variations, like, oh my God, this is, this is very interesting. But if you have the same keys pressing all the time, 
the entropy is quite low because you have the probability of the same event occurring again and again and again. So there is like a literally less, less surprise. And usually the melody contains the surprise, contains the variation of the song. It encapsulates this. So that's why we use the information entropy. Okay, great. Thank you. So uh, thanks, Aludme, again. Um, or wait, so there's still one more question. So Oksana is um, just because we have time and it's very interesting. So um, how do you classify um, how music satisfies us? Satisfies? So do you, do you, do you, yeah, yeah. Can you capture that? Oh, I mean, like there are some rules in music theory to, to combine uh, chords and notes together. There are some criteria about dissonance, like, ah, this note cannot be like uh, certain octaves or certain degrees uh, so distant from each other. But to be honest, I think uh, what satisfies is a purely like personal concept. Like uh, some people like a little bit of dissonance in songs, some people not. So like uh, some people like very monotonic and specific uh, coordination of notes. So like uh, music, art in that sense, I would say it, it depends. <laughs> it depends. You have to tune your, your you know, formulation for, for instance, like a, if you, this can be also expanded. This is a good question, actually. This can also be expanded because for certain types of songs, you're expecting certain, you know, things are going to be present. For instance, like classic music, you're expecting some, some kind of shape, rock, you're expecting something else. So it depends. Okay, great. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you very much. Uh, wait, there's another question. Okay, can you also read it? So uh, it seems uh, like yeah. So I'm here. Yeah, so I was like, uh, when oh, it was your question, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to present. So I thought like maybe I should ask it. Uh, so you started with this Beethoven's uh, music, but it seems like a noisy version, right? It was not clear, and you you did the reduction procedure, uh, which I algorithm, right? Uh, so is there any limit to how much you can reduce, like uh, do the reduction procedure uh, to a specific sheet of music? You know, like some. Yeah, I guess. Uh, Ooh, okay. uh, I don't know what do you mean by noise because, like, actually, yeah, the, 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 um, yeah it seems that uh, we heard extra white noise added to to the to the video clip uh, to this to this sound clip. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Like, I'm not supposed to be like this. Uh, maybe it's my background. I'm so sorry. But like, uh, this noise not supposed to be. First of all, okay. uh, and actually, where we reduct the reduction is, is the following way. We have a bunch of instruments. You want to select uh, the best of each, the, the most melodic part of each. Okay. So this reduction is according to what you want to achieve. For instance, if you want to achieve this reduction for a single instrument, that's your limit. But if you have, for instance, like I don't know, like uh, a music which is already designed for one instrument, why do you want to make reduction? Okay, you can do to make the music easier, and this is one of the points of the, the music reduction. Uh, indeed, you make arrangements to make a very hard, complicated composition, maybe easier and to sound alike. So the, the limit depends on the, I don't know, which user are you tagging to? Like, uh, who is going to play this music like in the end? So, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the answer. It was nice. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. So I have to restore order and take back the control of this session from the speakers. So thank uh, Ludmila again.